girls. It's so good to see you all again as we kick off a new season of the show. Now, I'm telling you, I was out sick for a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about why I was out sick, but I have here the gentleman who is the major force in why I have recuperated so well and that I'm back working so quickly. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jiquan Zhao. How are you, Dr. Zhao? I'm pretty good. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and share a little bit about what you do as an OBGYN. Well, thank you for inviting. Absolutely. So tell me, um, what inspired you? First of all, you're, you're from China. You were trained in China. Right. And what inspired you to become an OBGYN? Wow, I, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to talk about and that I w always wanted to be an OBGYN since medical school. However, mm -hmm. I couldn't get into an OBGYN residency program in China. Why? Uh, it's too competitive. Really competitive. Very okay. competitive. And most graduates would need some social connection with oh, the wow. hospitals okay. to get in. So how did you eventually get in? Well, only in the United States. Okay, here. Okay. Yes. All right. I was trained as a surgeon back in China. Okay. Yeah. So you've done all sorts of surgeries. Different things. Okay. Like Different what? Things. what have General you done? surgery. Okay. Gallbladder removal. Mm -hmm. uh, rectal cancer. Okay. Colon cancer. Oh wow. With the something like a subspecialty in breast cancer treatment. Oh wow. Okay. Yes. All right. So let's talk a little bit about preventive care because that's what all women need to do. Sure. And if there's anything that a male can help in that woman's life to help make that happen. So let's talk about some preventive care, pap, pelvic, breast examinations, all those things. Tell women what they need to get done on an annual basis. On an annual basis, mm -hmm. all women uh, should have the, really the basic, as you mentioned, the pap, pelvic, and uh, breast exam. Uh, of course, what really is, is required for, for a single individual mm -hmm. would, depend, would be dependent on her age. Mm -hmm. uh, for younger women, there's no recommendation for pap, pap smear until she turns, uh, they turn 21. Okay. And the mammogram is only recommended uh, for women at the age of 40 and after. Uh, there are exceptions, uh, women who have strong family history for breast cancer. Uh, some uh, women may have uh, multiple surgeries in the breast, mm -hmm. different biopsies, and they probably should have earlier mammogram. Okay. And uh, pap smear, as I said, is the recommendation for uh, pap smears uh, have changed constantly, okay. change. and recently the recommendation is starting pap smear at the age of 21, maybe every two to three years afterwards, unless somebody has a history of abnormal pap smears. Okay. So um, I know that a lot of women sometimes don't have access to medical care, insurance, etc. cetera. Um, so how can a woman know, um, what are some signals that something might not be right and that you need to get to the doctor? In the old days when uh, women didn't have access to uh, regular GYN care, mm -hmm. uh, the most common symptoms we looked for uh, in someone with cervical cancer for is, uh, was bleeding okay. vaginally, abnormally, uh, sometimes bleeding after sex. Okay. Um, nowadays, most women do have access especially in the United States and many other developed countries, mm -hmm. women, most women do have access to regular checkups. Thus, the incidence of cervical cancer remains uh, much lower than okay. those uh, found in developing countries. countries okay. yeah. So um, with breast cancer and, and getting the self-breast examination and then mammographies, tell women what they should look for there. Breast self-exam is always recommended by American College of OBGYN. There's absolutely, unfortunately, no evidence that self-breast exam makes a difference in terms of prognosis if somebody is diagnosed with breast cancer. So American Task Force actually stopped recommending that. Oh, wow. But we continue to recommend it. To recommend it. And uh, ACOG okay. hasn't changed that recommendation. Things to look for is, first, women should know 
uh, what is the right way to do a self mm -hmm. exam. You really can't squeeze against uh, the, the breast tissue, rather you should palpate from mm -hmm. above just with the fingertip so feel for anything okay. abnormal. And most women are good at doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the recommendation for, for mammogram, of course, uh, when, whenever she turns 40 okay. and we start offering we'll start. that every one to two years until she turns 50, then every year after. Okay. So I've heard, I don't know if this is true, that if you feel something on one side and you don't feel it on the other side that you should run to That's doctor. probably something <laughs> like a trick, yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. I have had uh, two women in the past four years who arrived uh, themselves because of concern for different, uh, mm -hmm. you feel know, on one side and the on, on the breasts and one actually had cancer oh. and the other something benign. Okay, yeah. so, um, and then there's, there's another myth I heard, I'm not sure if this is true, but I also heard if you feel like a small lump and you can move it around, that you might have a little cyst or, or a little tumor there, but it's usually not cancerous, that cancer is usually attached to your skin. Is that true? It can be true in, in certain cases. Uh, if a little mass is movable with good, clear margin, usually these are benign tumors. A benign tumor in, breast, uh, in the breast is, is something called fiber adenoma, just something benign. Mm -hmm. It does not change or increase uh, the risk for cancer. Okay. Uh, cancer, usually uh, breast cancer does not involve the skin unless uh, it's relatively late stage. Um, so when skin invo is involved, we are concerned that uh, there might be uh, metastasis. Uh, the cancer may have mm -hmm. gone somewhere else, yes. the lymph nodes in yeah. the axilla, in the for body. example, in the yeah. armpits. So let's talk about the fun part now, delivering babies, bringing yeah. life into the world. Sure. That is gotta That's be what we do too, the most awesome, as OBGYNs. Yeah, the most awesome thing. Tell me about your first delivery and what that was like for you? First delivery uh, since my practice or mm -hmm. since my residency training? Um, your very first one. Where very first one? I you would, were the catcher. <laughs> uh, let's just talk about the first delivery okay. that I had in my practice. Yes. Uh, I was on call that day. Okay. It is August 22nd, 2008. Oh, wow. Okay. I had my first call that day since I started practice in a hospital in Wisconsin. But you've been a doctor for a long time. Mm, yes. Yeah. Four years of training before that. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a patient, actually, of my partners okay. who arrived in labor full term, no complications. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot to talk amazing. about that. Yeah, Did it's you amazing. Cry? Uh, almost, because yes. the family shows so much appreciation mm -hmm. after delivery. Actually, I had pictures oh, I uh, would too. with the little baby yes. and actually some more pictures oh. the year after that. Oh, that's awesome. I think that is so awesome. Yeah, everything went well. There's no complications. Mom was happy, baby mm -hmm. was happy, and I will never forget. August 22nd, 2008. Wow. I was with my friend when she had her baby. And um, she had complications. It, it just wouldn't come out. So they decided they were going to do a C-section. And they had like a little curtain over her so she couldn't see. And when they cut her, I thought I was fine. I, I felt OK. And the doctor flipped up this thing on her belly. And I go, what's that? And he said, oh, that's a fibroid. And I was like, cut it out, because it's pretty good size. And he said, no, I'm going to put it back in, because it'll go down after I take the baby out. And then the next thing I heard was, Catch her, catch her. And I said, catch who? Well, it, it was me. <laughs> so all I know is when I woke up, I was You're in the fainting. bed next to her. Oh yeah, I sure. fainted. Oh yeah, I was not. That's not uncommon. And, uh, for women. She's looking at me like, thanks for being my support. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> faint. Well, that's quite <laughs> some experience. But I didn't even know I was going to faint. So that, that was kind of nerve wracking for me. So have you had a multiple birth yet? I had uh, quite a few twin twins. deliveries, yes, okay. and most of them actually delivered vaginally, okay. both twins, wow. okay. and uh, uh, some, of course, delivered by sister okay. section. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and what's been some maybe challenges for you in delivering babies? I think for any obstetrician, uh, the most challenging would be 
some unexpected results, something okay. that you know you certainly didn't anticipate. Uh, shoulder dystocia is mm -hmm. one of many, of course. And what is that? It's shoulder. 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 Shoulders. So okay. the baby's the head, head is out. is born, but the shoulder. Too wide. Shoulder yeah. yeah, get stuck. Wow. Ouch. Yeah. That's all I can say. Ouch. Fortunately, I haven't had any oh, that's good. bad experience with okay. that. Everybody would have had a few cases of shoulder dystocia, okay. but uh, I did, but I, you know, all you were the able kids, to, yeah, yeah. were able to really resolve that okay. with no complications. Yeah, a little butter. Some yeah, crystal. different <laughs> manipulations you can, yeah. you can do. And uh, of course, mom, uh, whatever the mom does makes a huge difference too. Okay, excellent, yeah. excellent. And um, I also wanted to ask you about um, breech babies. Breech babies. Yeah. Uh, since the 1998 study in, Hannon, uh, in Canada, it's a multiple center, uh, multiple center study, uh, breech extraction is no longer recommended. So if somebody is found to be uh, in a breech presentation, usually the recommendation is either go for elective cesarean section at okay. around 39 weeks, or uh, we can try to so-called external version, try to turn the baby around okay. so she can have a vaginal delivery. Okay, very good, very good. So breech, yeah, for those that don't know, breech babies when the legs are first. Right. Instead of head down, oh. legs come first. That's right. Okay. okay. Um, did you deliver your own son? I wasn't allowed no. to at that time. Oh, they don't allow you. I was doing you. research in the okay, lab at that okay. time. Um, really, just a couple of months before I started my residence oh, and training. Oh, okay. He came just a little too soon. Yeah. He came, <laughs> yes. He was delivered in New York, and I did my training oh, in wow. Detroit. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, when we come back, we're going to share a crazy story with you, and I'll share a little bit about my own robotic surgery the newest thing, and Dr. Shik Wan Zhao is the best at it, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, Bienvenidos, and we are here talking with Dr. Shik Wan Zhao, who is at the University of Connecticut Health Center, and he is an amazing OBGYN and tops in his field in robotic surgery. That's one of the reasons why I had him come. I went to Dr. Zhao saying, oh my God, I'm using the bathroom like every two minutes. <laughs> and um, not that often, but more often than I should. And come to find out, I did have a fibroid, which he removed for me robotically. So tell everybody a little bit about robotic surgery. But before you even do that, I gotta thank your team. I gotta thank the entire team. You are so welcome. Um, that you work with. You're amazing and your entire team is, they are incredible. So I wanna, I wanna name them as you see them here. You'll see pictures of Irene, Carol, Tyshawn, Nancy, Lorna, and Cindy. And along with them, there were nurses who prepped me. Uh, the anesthesiologist, I love you, no pain. I felt no pain. I was not awake during surgery. Um, I think that's one of the most important doctors there can be, an anesthesiologist, so you don't feel anything. And then, of course, you who did the, the bulk of the I think we did work. what we are supposed to do. Yeah, but... Um, you are special, I think, but I think you are... everybody does what they're supposed to do on a daily basis, but there are certain people that do it with genuine care and love for what they do. And I don't care whether it's medicine or education or fixing a car, um, there comes a passion with that. Sure. And so that passion makes a difference. My hat's off to all of you for having that passion. Really appreciate it, and my family really appreciates well, it. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little talk about fibroid. What, what is a fibroid? A fibroid is a, a type of benign tumor that can be found in the uterus, mm -hmm. uh, the womb, mm -hmm. of course, for many women. Mm -hmm. the, the, most women with fibroids don't have any symptoms, but the most common symptoms for women with fibroids are two. One is abnormally heavy bleeding mm -hmm. or prolonged bleeding. Two, severe pain mm -hmm. or dysmenorrhea, called the cramping pain cramping associated pain. with menstrual cycles. Mm -hmm. okay. So 
Um, if a, a woman goes to the OBGYN, she gets her pap and pelvic, and they tell her, you have um, some fibroids, and they're the size of a pinhead. And you have several. Should they worry? N mostly no. Okay. It depends on whether she has any concern. She's bothered because of fibroids. Okay. What so if um, she is still um, able to bear children and she wants to have children? Do you suggest removing them before having children or no? It depends on the location of the fibroids. Okay. Uh, if you know the fibroids can grow on the surface of the uterus, it can grow in the muscle layers. It can grow really deeper in the uh, lining, okay. very close to the lining. Those fibroids close to the lining may be uh, causing uh, difficulty getting pregnant okay. or increased risk for miscarriage for some women. Okay. So it depends. If somebody does not have any history of any problem getting pregnant, there's no need to do anything. But uh, for those who do have problem achieving a pregnancy, uh, removal of the fibroids may be reasonable, mm -hmm. and it's actually commonly done called something called myomectomy. Okay. So um, I understand it's very common that many women have fibroids. Um, how come? And what causes them? I don't think we understand exactly uh, what's causing mm -hmm. the fibroids, but the, the understanding is there's a single a type of cell originating from the muscles okay. which duplicates, continues to duplicate and uh, eventually it's getting bigger like a mass growing bigger and bigger uh, just more known as fibroids, okay. yes. All right. Um, so let's now discuss your most challenging surgery. I know you had a patient that um, you did a robotic surgery on and it was quite the challenge. And we're going to put up some pictures here for um, you to tell us about. Um, so the first picture that people will see, can you describe that? Um, absolutely. The first picture actually uh, uh, shows some uh, scarring tissue between the anterior abdominal wall and uh, the omentum, uh, part of the fatty tissue connect to the, to the bowel. Mm -hmm. Um, this specific patient has a history of surgery for removal of the fibroids, mm -hmm. and we believe the scarring tissue was secondary uh, to the surgery that she had. Yes, she did have a bikini cut surgery. Yeah, she shared that with me. Okay. Okay. And uh, before we could do anything, uh, we had to really remove the scarring tissue to actually see where the uterus was where the fibroids were. Okay. So the next picture we're going to see, can you describe that? And that it is a pretty good size fibroid. Yeah, the next picture was taken after the scarring tissue was taken away. Apparently what you can see here is um, a very tall uterus, I have to say tall, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's kind of elongated really. At the very top of the picture, you see that's actually the very uh, uh, start of the uterus okay. and you see a little bump to the right mm -hmm. and that's a fibroid okay. and further up there's a bigger lump here right. with blood vessels on the surface wow. this is a bigger fibroid okay. and the vessels are there because the fibroid tumors really needed blood okay. to wow. grow, they keep to grow. growing yes. and it's the biggest you've seen right? It's I guess you've ever quite big. Seen, yes. Overall, the uterus and the fibroids together uh, really made that patient look like she she was five to six months pregnant. pregnant. Yeah, exactly. And then the the final picture. Talk a little bit about that, and then I want you to really tell us about how difficult. I know that that surgery was very difficult for you. The the last picture is not much different from, you know. Uh, pictures from uh, other women who had the same procedure. Mm -hmm. Basically what we see is the the top of the vagina that's closed, the vaginal cuff, mm -hmm. called, we call vaginal cuff that was closed and uh, there was no bleeding, the bladder looked fine, everything just looked great after right. surgery. After surgery, perfect, perfect. So um, tell folks how, how long, the typical surgery I know is about an hour and a half. 
But this surgery took you a little over six hours? Um, it's uh, close to five hours. Five hours. Mm -hmm. And um, how long? Um, cutting this up, getting it out through those I six little incisions. We're going to show the incisions right now. Here's a picture of um, one of the incisions there. Folks are looking at that picture. And you see how tiny that incision is. How did you right. get this big thing out of those little tiny Yes, the, the whole case uh, lasted longer, uh, which uh, was completely expected because of the bulkiness mm -hmm. in the uterus and fibroids uh, and uh, her history of surgery mm -hmm. in the past. We really spent time, almost uh, 40, 40, 45 minutes, just to get the scarring down okay. to see the uterus. See and after that, of course, we have to do something called myomectomy to remove uh, the top of the, the, the fibroid at the very top of the uterus to, so that we, we could see better uh, lower in the, in the uterus where the, the, the other fibroids were identified. And we did actually two fibroids. Uh, uh, we, we removed uh, two fibroids before we could actually start doing the hysterectomy. And mm -hmm. of course, because of the scarring tissue, there was significant uh, difficulty identifying the normal anatomy. Yes. And uh, there was scarring formation wow. between the back of the uterus wow. and the, the anterior uh, wall of the, the bowel. Wow. So we were able to take, an, take that down, and then we could see normal anatomy, and then we could get the get uterine vessels, it. really secure the vessels, and they keep moving on. And the key is, uh, you know, how to really get the big fibroid uterus out? That's a very good question. You, you, you probably would think that, you know, nothing is going to come out of the very small incision. Uh, we actually have to use an instrument called uterine uh, morselator. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Basically an instrument that will grab on the big fibroid uterus and a little piece of tissue will be taken out. Is, he, is that the claws that you see here in this picture? Say it again, I'm sorry. Are, is, that these, is that part of the no, instrument? No, it's different. No, no. Okay, it's a different yeah, instrument. Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything uh, on, this pictures, okay. on these pictures, but uh, it's called uh, uterine morselator. Okay. So with, with the morselator, small piece of tissue uh, were taken out. Of course, that morselation itself uh, was quite time consuming. But I think it's all worth of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Eventually, patients with, uh, with uh, a robotic cystic hysterectomy will do so much better because uh, they, they don't have blood loss, significant blood loss, have major complications, and they recover faster. They, mm -hmm. they, they usually stay in the hospital overnight and then they'll go home. Yeah. And they usually recover pretty well. Within two weeks, a lot of women uh, may return to normal activity and mm -hmm. uh, some may go back to work yeah. if no heavy lifting is involved. Right, right. I think I recouped pretty well. So let's talk about those incisions now. We're going to see some pictures of the incisions and um, there are six. The top one is, what's that one? The top one is for the scope, the so-called mm -hmm. endoscope. And this is, uh, this is the little window through which we can see where, where we are, what we're doing. Okay. And then the other incisions crucial. are just the other take? incisions are for the so-called robotic robotic arms. You know, we need to have the little arms, arms to assist in surgery. And, and we'll see a picture of the robot there. Yes, okay. and some of that uh, incisions, the 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 left lower quadrant uh, was where we made the incision to put the morselator through. So we could get the get fiber most of the uterus. Fiber yes. out there. Yes. So you know, what I looked first of all online about everything before I had the robotic surgery and tried to learn as much as I could. And um, seeing the robot and the doctor sitting working the control made me think like, if your doctor is really good at video games, he's going to be pretty good at the surgery. Yes. Yes. <laughs> A little there eye was... coordination movement. There were some uh, studies uh, which showed that uh, kids who are good gamers uh, really function better than some physicians, some surgeons. So the eye hand coordination, that little joke wasn't important. a joke, it's very true. It is very true. Very true. Okay. 
Um, and now we're going to show some post pictures of what the incisions look like. And that's at uh, five weeks. And you almost can't, can't even see two of them. They're basically almost gone. You really, yes. They heal really, they, they, uh, heal really well by mm -hmm. five weeks. And uh, you may see a little discoloration other than that. Uh, and what did you use to, um, to seal the incision? Because there's no stitches. It almost looks like super glue. We did use super glue on top of the skin. But the skin. You were joking. <laughs> joking. It is real. That's real super glue? Yes. It is something called derma. It is a glue that's, you know, that's used, uh, safe used on human beings. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. It, it does, you guys. It looks exactly but like it. If you can look at the incision, I'll put the picture back up so you can see yeah. that little yes. over, before over the Before the super glue was applied, the skin incision um, would need to be closed okay. with subcutaneous closure. Okay. So the stitch, the suture was buried under oh, the skin. Oh, it's buried under yes. the skin. Yes. Is that for cosmetic reasons? Absolutely. Because you know we women are vain. We do want to make all women <laughs> look beautiful okay. if we can. That is so awesome. So, um, how many robotic surgeries have you done? Uh, now it's really about 100. Yeah, about 100. Yes. Not many, but uh, enough to say I'm really comfortable with oh, the procedure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And so, how would a woman know if she's a candidate for robotic surgery? Let's put it this way any, any uh, patient with big fibers uh, could be a good candidate for that. Certainly in the past, a lot of uh, uh, women had hysterectomy done with big, in, big incisions. And then women, some women have had hysterectomy done through the regular uh, laparoscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, these are stiff instruments, uh, commonly used still for a lot of providers, uh, especially I'm using those too for mm -hmm. minor, minor procedures such as tubal ligation, diagnosed laparoscopy. Okay to see, to look for the reason why women have pain in the pelvis. Okay. But uh, with the robotic approach, um, we can really conquer bigger fibroid uterus. Okay. Um, so a, a woman, if she, or her doctor tells her, you know, you, you need to have fibroids removed, almost any woman can come to you to get robotic surgery then. Yeah, basically. most women are. Because you're not going to see anything as big as this anymore. So if you can get that out, you can get almost anything out. Uh, mostly. <laughs> the exceptions are actually, I had a couple of women I have to really abort the procedure. Okay. Both uh, had problems with their lungs. And oh, uh, when okay. the robotic hysterectomy is done, the, the patient is put in head down, legs up position. Yes. And uh, those women with lung problems may not tolerate oh. that position and they may have problem getting the oxygen. Okay. No, I was good. I bet I'm fat, Beauty. but I bend like Gumby. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to wrap up the show, Dr. Absolutely. Zhao. It was so great to have you here. I thank Absolutely. you so much personally. And my friend who had her surgery, she thanks you too. And um, if you need robotic surgery, this is the man to see, Dr. Shikwan Zhao, out of the University of Connecticut. And I want to thank you at home for watching. I want to thank my viewers over in the UK and in Ireland. And welcome, Jamaica. May I understand you know, pick up the show. I'm so happy that you all are watching. And you will see more of Lynette Cardi's show in our next taping. Thanks for watching. And remember, I love you more than I love cooked food. <laughs>